Open up your Bibles to Numbers 32. Numbers 32. We're looking still at the, the judgment seat of Jacob is what we're calling it. Kind of the, the end of life review that Jacob does of his sons. And it's, it's not just historical. It's also prophetic. He's, he's looking at their lives. He's assessing their character. And he's giving some words about what is coming. As Jacob is doing this, he's sitting in Egypt. He had gone down there during a famine that had hit, the one that was prophesied by Joseph. Joseph, his second to youngest son, was the prime minister of Egypt. And so uh, Jacob and all of his family, his other 11 sons and his one daughter, had come down to, come down to, uh, to Egypt. And that is where they will be living uh, and, and they will live there for some, some hundreds of years because during this time uh, they will go into slavery and then Moses will lead them out at the Exodus eventually. But Jacob, as he does, as he, as he makes these statements that we've been sourcing in Genesis 49, he's 147 years old. And he calls his sons before him for this one last grand review. Beginning in, in Genesis 48, he starts with his grandsons by Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. And then he goes down the role of his sons. We have Reuben and Levi and Simeon he dealt with together because they were very similar. And their future, the, their prophetic future was very similar as well. He dealt with Judah. Anything special about Judah? Who comes from Judah? Jesus, Jesus comes through Judah. <laughs> David comes through Judah. Solomon comes through Judah. Many, the, the line of the kings, right, is Judah. So Judah, and then last week we looked at, or I'm sorry, uh, we looked at Zebulun and Issachar. Zebulun, of course, he's up there in the north. He's close to the sea, but not on the sea. One day, we think, probably during the millennium, he will have land that, that is on the coast, and he'll be able to profit by the, the seafaring. And then we dealt with Issachar. Issachar was strong, but then he ended up getting comfortable in his strength, and he ended up paying tribute to the rest of the, to the, of the Canaanite peoples. And then last week, we spent our time looking at Dan. And Dan led the children of Israel into idolatry. Dan, in the time of the judges, led the children of Israel into idolatry. And, uh, and so we have... Uh, he's, he's missing from that role of the tribes there at the end of, of Scripture in Revelation when, when, when the Lord is calling out 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes to make up the 144,000. Dan's not there. And many believe because of the key role that he played in leading the children of Israel into idolatry again and again and again. It wasn't just the one time in, in Judges it happened all through the time of the kings that Dan was instrumental in going astray. We come this morning to Gad. Gad. He's dealt with in Genesis chapter 49, verse 16. Now I have you turn to Numbers 32 because the, the verse in Genesis is very short. Let me read it to you. He, he speaks, this is Jacob speaking to Gad. He says, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Gad was Jacob's seventh son, his son by Zilpah, who is the handmaid of Leah. So one of his two concubines, thus far we've dealt with all of Leah's children, we've dealt with one of Bilhah's children, and now we're dealing with one of Zilpah's children. Again, family trees should not be this complicated, uh, but when you have multiple wives... All sorts of bad things happen, as is the case all throughout Scripture. So the seventh son, Gad, means simply troop. So kind of significant that he says, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. It is interesting, if you go back and you read in Genesis 30 and you read about the birth of Gad, he was not named by his mother, Zilpah, he was named by his... Stepmother, Leah. So Leah, all of, all of Leah's children were, were technically, or all of Zilpah's children were technically Leah's children because she was her handmaid. And so when Zilpah 
delivered Gad, Leah stepped up and said, his name's going to be this. So it wasn't named by his, his biological mother, but by his, his legal mother, as it were. And we start off here with kind of a, a strange request. We're going to go forward here, and we're going to look at what comes from Gad, because you probably know more about Gad than you think you do. Uh, as I was going over and preparing this message, I thought, well, we've, we've dealt with most of, of what we have to deal with here of the, the well-known sons. And then I got into Gad, and, and I realized there's an awful lot that we can learn from Gad, though, though it's kind of uh, not one of the more well-known stories in Scripture, perhaps. Toward the end of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses and the people are preparing for the conquest of Canaan. So, the children of Israel came out of Egypt, at, we call it the Exodus. They cross the Red Sea, and they don't go the short route. It's not far. It's about six days' walk from northern Egypt to, to Canaan. But you would go through the territory of the Philistines. And so God didn't lead the children of Israel through the area of the Philistines. He led them south. And they went down to Sinai. And they were at Sinai, and they received the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and whatnot. But then they came up north, you remember this? And they stopped at Kadesh Barnea, which is the extreme south of the land of Canaan. And at Kadesh Barnea, that's where Moses sent in 12 spies. Oh, yeah. you, know the, you know the story? 12 men went to spy on Canaan. Yeah. 10 were bad, and 2 were good. So the, the, they, that happened at Kadesh Barnea. They decided, we can't go in and inherit the land. And so God condemned the children of Israel to wander for 40 years. While that generation, that faithless generation, died off. Well, we're coming to the close of that 40 years. They're winding down. I think I've mentioned if, if their population is what we believe it was, they were holding several dozen funerals every day because that's the population. that they were, they were burying people constantly for 40 years as the faithless generation died off. But now they're, they're wrapping that up. They're coming to the close, and they're getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. Now, Moses knows that he's not going into Canaan. Real quick, why is Moses not allowed to go into the land of Canaan? He hit the rock. He disobeyed. He didn't give God glory when he should have. Okay? And so Moses knows he's not going to lead the children of Israel into the land. Rather, he knows that someone else is going to lead him in. Who's going to lead the children of Israel in for the conquest of Canaan? You remember? Joshua. Joshua. So we're coming to that point, but the children of Israel are still on the east bank of the Jordan River. Okay, they're on the east bank. Moses is still their leader, but he knows he's going to be passing the reins of leadership to Joshua. So all of, the, all of the children of Israel on the east bank of the Jordan River preparing to go into Canaan, which would be on the west bank. Okay, So this is what's going on. And as the people were preparing to go into the land, knowing that a fight is right in front of them, they know they're going to have to fight to get this territory Something strange happens in Numbers 32. Look at verse 1. It says, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, which is who we're looking at, had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Gezer and the land of Gilead, that, behold, the place was a place for cattle, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, look down at verse 4, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. Now, I'm going I'm to do my best to do this mirror image so that it's, it's right for you guys. So, they're on the east bank of the Jordan River. So the Jordan River runs right here. Over there is what is Canaan, the land of Canaan, the west bank, okay? They're over here on the east bank, and if you remember reading in, in, in Scripture, you read about Sihon, and you read about Og, the kings of Bashan, 
and they were big guys. They lived, and their territory was on the east bank of the Jordan River. The children of Israel had already fought. They had already defeated the people who lived on the east bank. So the west bank, still totally the wild west. It's inhabited by Canaanites and idolaters, and they're going to have to go in and possess that. But right now they're on the east bank, and the children of Gad, the children of Reuben, and the, we'll see a little bit later, the half-tribe of Manasseh come up to Moses and they say to him, Hey, this land on the east side of the, of the Jordan River is really nice for cattle. And we have cattle, so here's what we want to do. You leave us here, and, and we're not going to go over and inherit on the west side of the river. Now, what does that sound like at just first listen? That sounds like cowardice. That sounds like, oh, so you want the land we've already got, huh? You don't want to go over here. Well, that's what it sounded like to Moses. Look at verse 6 of, of Numbers 32. Moses immediately assumes that they're trying to avoid the fight that lies before them. Verse 6. And Moses said unto the children of Gad, to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. You remember the twelve spies? <laughs> Moses is worried. Hey, the last time we had something like this, we ended up wandering for 40 years and conducting lots of funerals. Verse 14, And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, an increase of sinful men, to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord towards Israel. For if ye turn away from after him, he will yet again lead them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all this people. So just like we think, Moses thought, so you're trying to get out of going and fighting, and you're also going to discourage everybody else. Your decision, when you say, ah, we're, we've got cows, and this is really nice grazing land, so we're just going to stay here. That's going to discourage and bring down the faith of everybody else. And the last time we did that was, was at Kadesh Barnea, and, and you know what happened. But Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh responded quickly that they weren't being cowards. As a matter of fact, far from it. In verse 16, they tell Moses that here's what we'll do. We'll build fences and we will build sheep coats or, or sheep folds and, and we'll, we'll put our flocks and our herds in them. There are the cities that we've already dispossessed. We'll let our women and our children stay in those. And we'll go with you. Not only will we go with you, we'll lead. We'll lead the fight. We'll be the first ones in. Look at verse 18. <clears throat> we will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. Speaking of the other ten tribes. Okay? We won't go home to our inheritance on the east bank until everyone else has received their inheritance on the west bank. <clears throat> Verse 19. For we will not inherit with them on yonder side, Jordan, or forward, because our inheritance is fallen to us on this side, Jordan, eastward. How's that sound to you? Do you feel a little bit better about Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, these, these tribes? They're, they're willing to go in. They say, look, we're not, we're not being faithless. We really genuinely like this land. We'll lead the fight. We'll go with you. We'll leave our families. We'll leave our possessions behind. We'll lead the fight. And we won't come home till everybody's got what's coming to them. Sounds a lot better. And Moses buys into it as well. Look at verse 20. And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go, all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord, until he hath driven out his enemies from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord. Do you get the idea that Moses thinks that the Lord's going to be involved in this fight? Yeah. He keeps saying it, doesn't he? The Lord's going to do this. This, this is of the Lord. Verse, in the middle of verse 22, Then afterward ye shall return, 
and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land on the east side of Jordan shall be your possession before the Lord. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Did you know that that verse that we quote so often is part of this story? Moses tells the children of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, he says, look, if you'll do what you're saying, if you'll lead the fight, if you'll stay till it's done, and then come home, all's well. Fantastic. But if you're setting us up, if you're going to act like you're going to go and you're going to lead and then you slip back and go home, be sure your sin will find you out. If you do what you could do, you're going to be in trouble. But if you do what you're saying you're going to do, if you're faithful, if you're, if you're valiant, if you're brave in the fight, then all is well. And the children of Gad and Reuben honored their promise. They kept their end of the bargain. They led the fight into the land of Canaan. And they assisted the rest of the tribes to come into the inheritance that God had promised. And you read over the, the book of Joshua, and you read about the conquest of Canaan. They first went in, and they went in across, uh, across the Jordan River. Do uh, you remember how they crossed the Jordan River? On dry ground. you remember that the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the Jordan River, and it, it stopped. It just started to pile up on one side, and the rest of it ran away. The children of Israel crossed the Jordan. They went first to Jericho. Then they went to Ai. And they, they had this central campaign. Then they had a northern campaign and, and a southern campaign. And eventually they finish off, as much as they would, the Canaanite peoples. And they inherit the land. And Joshua, if you read through Joshua, the first part of it is uh, a lot of story. And then you get about halfway through it, it turns to geography. And it's all and so-and-so shall inherit from this point to this point to this point to this point. And, and it's a little bit more technical. All of that's done. All of that's behind them. And the children of Israel have finished. The children of Gad and Manasseh and Reuben have fought. They fought valiantly. They gained spoils as they went when they defeated a city and they saw something that they wanted. They took it along with themselves. But eventually the, came, the time came... When Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh had fulfilled their promise, and it was time for them to go home. Look, we, we kept our end of the bargain. We've got all of our people on the east bank of the Jordan River. We want to go home to them. But that's where a problem arises. Now, I want you to flip to Joshua chapter 22. Joshua chapter 22. There's a problem. We'll start in verse 1. It says, Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. So Joshua said, Hey, look, guys, your, your job is complete. You kept your promise. And now it's time for you to return to your inheritance on the east side of the Jordan with honor and with the gratitude of your brethren. Look at verse 8. And he, this is, this is Joshua speaking to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, and he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, with very much cattle, with silver, with gold, with brass, with iron, with very much raiment. Divide the spoil of your enemies within your brethren. So the men of these three tribes head in the direction of home in verse 9. Now, take a look here and you see exactly what we're talking about. You have the west bank where all of the tribes, that would be what we would consider Israel to be today, the west bank. And then you go over on the east bank and you have Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben who inherited, they, they took their inheritance on the east bank because it was good for cattle. So, everything's been claimed. This is kind of what it looks like in Joshua. They've inherited their territories. They're, they're settling in. They're still dealing with a few problems because you remember some of the tribes didn't cast the, the inhabitants of the land completely out. So, we're dealing with a few problems throughout. But, by and large, the battle's over 
And Joshua releases the children of Ephraim, Gad, and, uh, of Gad, Manasseh, and Reuben to go over to their inheritance. Look at verse 10. Here's where the problem crops up. And when they came unto the borders of Jordan, that, that are in the land of Canaan, which means they're on which side? If they're on the if they're on the banks of the Jordan within Canaan, that means they're on the west side. Okay? They're on the west bank that are in the land of Canaan. The children of Reuben, the children of Gab, and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. So on the west bank, as all of these men, get the picture here, all of these men are returning home. They haven't seen their family in a few years because of what they've been doing in Canaan. They've been fighting. They're returning with all of the spoils of war. They're returning with all of the stuff that they've accumulated through the defeat of the Canaanites. They're headed home. On the west bank, just before they cross the Jordan, they decide, hey, I know what let's do. Let's build an altar. And they do. A, not just a little altar. No, we're not talking about a, a little pile of rocks. We're talking about a, a great altar to see to, the Bible tells us. Verse 12. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the altar, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them? Wait, wait, wh why? Well, remember, the children of, of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, they led the fight. Why? Well, they were casting out and, and destroying the Canaanites, the idolaters, and now they're building an altar on the west uh, on the west bank, and the children of Israel say, "Look, we're real good right now at killing idolaters, <clears throat> and here you are setting up this altar. You see, there's only supposed to be one altar. The altar is supposed to be in Shiloh. Why? Well, because that's where the tabernacle is. The tabernacle is in Shiloh, and there's one altar. It's out in front of the tabernacle, and it's where." The priest goes and he offers sacrifices on the one altar. And now these people are building another altar on the banks of the Jordan. And the children of Israel say, look, we're not going to have idolaters in our midst. We're going to do away with you guys. If you're going to if you're going to cause problems, we'll just kill you and be done with it. We don't we don't need more idolatry. We've, we've already dealt with that amongst the people of the land. So the, set, the ten tribes, to their credit, they don't go up to war immediately. They send an envoy. They send a, a group of men uh, before they send their army to find out what's going on in verses 13 and 14. The envoy is Phineas, He's the son of the priest, Eleazar. And ten elders, one from each of the, of the ten tribes on the west side. And they go, and so you have Phineas, and you have these ten elders, and they come up, and they, they approach the, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the, the, the Manassites, and they come up to them and they say, look, what's going on with this altar? This isn't, this isn't okay. You're not allowed to build altars because that leads to idolatry. That leads to problems. And, and we'll kill you right here, right now, if this is going to be a problem, is essentially their, their message. Look at verse 16. Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, what trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord in that ye have builded you an altar that ye might rebel this day against the Lord? They go and they, they cite, if you, if you read on, they cite the sin of Balaam. You remember Balaam? What's Balaam most, most famous for? He had a donkey. You remember Balaam's donkey? He does. <laughs> it talked, right? Balaam's donkey, Balaam, the, the sin of Balaam was the sin of compromise. They had intermarried with the people of the land. That's the sin of Balaam. Do you remember the sin of Achan? Achan, we find this story in Joshua chapter 7. Achan was the one who, they destroyed Jericho, and Jericho was supposed to be all for God. Everything in Jericho was to be dedicated to the Lord. But Achan, he went in there, and you remember what he saw? He saw some gold, he saw some silver, and he saw some clothing that he really, really wanted. And so he took it, and he hid it under his tent. 
And then the children of Israel went to fight at Ai. And do you remember what happened? They lost. So they come off of this tremendous victory and, and this high of Jericho, and then they lose. And, and the people are devastated. And Joshua goes and he falls on his face before the Lord, and he says, Lord, what are you doing? And God says, get up. There's sin in the camp. And so they go, and they, they narrow it down until they come to Achan. And Achan has this gold and this silver, and he brings it out. And the reason that they lost at Ai was because of Achan's secret private sin. Yeah. Okay? It cost everybody. And so the children of Israel, do you remember what they did to Achan? They killed him. They killed him. They killed his family. And they raised a big pile of stones over them, and they call it the Valley of Achor. Okay? Big monument. Okay? So now we have the children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh building this altar, and the children of Israel come up and they say, look, you remember Achan, don't you? You remember what we had to do to him because of his disobedience? Well, we will do the same to you if, if this is going to be a problem. Why is this altar here? This is unacceptable. This looks like idolatry. So you remember, first, with the children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, it looked like cowardice. Hey, we want to inherit on this side while everybody else goes and fights. But they straighten it out. No, no, no. We're not trying to get out of the fight. We'll leave the fight. We just really like this land. Okay, we're, we're good. So now, another misunderstanding. What's with the altar? This looks like idolatry, and we'll kill you right here, right now, if that's what this is. The men of the tribes are perceptive, and they see what may happen in the future. The men of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, they're very perceptive men, and they're going to give the explanation for this altar. You see, they have to cross the Jordan to get to their inheritance. The Jordan River is, is a pretty big deal. Even today, it's a big deal. As a matter of fact, if you look up here on the map, you'll see this is modern Israel. Okay, Israel runs up to the Jordan River. On the east bank of the Jordan River, it's an entirely different country called Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan. So the Jordan River is kind of a big deal. And the children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh know, hey, this, is, this river might pose a problem. It's too good of a dividing line. It's too good of a border. You see, what, what we're afraid is going to happen, look at verse 21. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, The Lord God of gods... The Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel, he shall know, if it be in rebellion or in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. Essentially, if, if we're alive, you can kill us. We're, we're not doing this out of idolatry at all. Here's their reason, verse 24. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying, in time to come... Your children might speak unto our children, so the children of the West Bank, talking to the children of the East Bank, saying, What have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, and ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Do you, do you see what they're worried about? They say, look, look, the Jordan's a very good dividing line, like a dividing line for nations, as it is today. They said, we don't want one day your kids to be able to tell our kids, so we're talking generations out, we don't want your kids to be able to tell our kids, hey, only the people on the west side are actually children of Israel. We're the ones who serve God. We don't know what you're doing over there on the east bank. That's what's going on. The children of, of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh are concerned about this. They're worried that the ten tribes on the west side of Jordan would look at the tribes on the east side and say, you're not really one of us. Do, do you see their concern? Their greatest fear was, in verse 25, that your children 
make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Good, would you say that's a good, at least a good concern on their part? Yeah. yeah. They're concerned for their children's walk with God. <laughs> but what's the altar going to do? What, what's with, why build an altar? Well, they give their reasoning for that. Look at verse 28. Therefore said we that it shall be when they shall say so to us or to our generations in time to come, that we may say again, behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which your fathers made, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice, but it is a witness between us and you. This altar is not for sacrifice. This altar is the altar of witness. This altar is built after the pattern of the tabernacle in Shiloh, after the pattern of that altar. Before the tabernacle, there was a stone altar, and that's where the sacrifices were made to Jehovah. And the men of the eastern tribes had made a replica of the tabernacle at Shiloh, that, that altar, on the bank of the Jordan. And if the people of the western tribes told the people of the eastern tribes that they weren't really part of Israel, the people on the east side could say to them, look, look at this altar. Look at this altar. We built that. That altar is the same as the altar that you have in Shiloh. We're God's chosen people as well. This, this altar is a pattern of that altar so that you can understand that we're one of you. Look at verse 30. And when Phinehas, the priest, and the princes of the congregation, and the heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, to the children of Manasseh, This day ye perceive that the Lord is among us. Because ye have not committed this trespass against the Lord, now ye have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. They're, they're pleased. What you did is a good thing. That witness on the west bank that says the people on the east bank they're part of us. Israel is not just on the west bank in the land of Canaan. Israel is on both sides of the Jordan. Both sides of the Jordan serve Jehovah. This is important. This is, this is something that the children of, of Gad and Reuben and Manasseh, they said, look, we're not doing this for us, and we're not doing this for you. We're doing this for our children. We're doing this for the future. When, when time has passed, and when the Jordan is, is our dividing line, we don't want your kids to be able to tell our kids, you're not even one of us. No, we are one of you. We serve Jehovah. And so the children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, they went home. They inherited their land. The children on the, on the west bank did the same. They inherited and they settled in after the time of Joshua. And then they went into the time of Judges. And that was not a great time. But what, what became of Gad? What happened to Gad? Well, since the tribe of Gad was without a natural boundary on the east, they did have to maintain a very strong military. The people of Gad were a very strong and a very warlike people. They were fierce and they were loyal. And they would one day fight very valiantly under King David. David of the tribe of Judah would rule from Jerusalem, his capital, and the children of Gad would serve under him. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 8 says, And the Gadites there separated themselves unto David into the hold to the wilderness men of might and men of war fit for the battle that could handle the shield and buckler whose faces were like the faces of lions and were swift as the rose upon the mountain. That's what became of Gad. They turned into a fierce, warlike people. A bunch of warriors who were who had faces like lions. I don't know exactly what, what that means. Their teeth grew out a little bit. I don't know. They were, they were a warlike people who were ready to go, and they fought in the service of their good king. If you go all the way to the end of Scripture, and you were to look in Revelation 7, verse 5, Dan didn't make it into that list there in Revelation 
of the 12,000, 12,000, 12,000 to make up the 144,000? Gad made it. Gad's in the list. He makes the list and, and will faithfully be represented all the way there at the end of time. So what can we learn from this passage? What is the, what is the lesson for us out of this kind of a obscure part of Scripture? Maybe a passage, maybe, maybe a story that you say, I know I've heard that before, but wasn't as familiar with it. Okay, what can we learn? Well, here's, here's the lesson this morning. We make some very big and very bold claims about our God, don't we? You and I, we claim that he, our God, is omniscient, meaning that he's all-knowing. We claim that he's omnipresent, that he's everywhere all at once. We claim that he's omnipotent, which means he has all power. Yeah. We claim that our God can provide for needs, that he can heal sickness, and that he can protect in any situation. We claim that our God is the one and only true God that has ever existed or ever will exist. Would you agree with all of those things that we say about our God? Yeah, we serve a great God, don't we? He's amazing, and we read about his stories in Scripture, and it's tremendous. Here's the question for you. What is there in your life? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a point I've asked myself. Okay, what is it in your life that is only explainable by the God you claim to serve? You see, we claim to serve a big God who has all of this power and all of this might. What is it in your life that people look at and they say, that's because of their God? That's because of their God. Well, maybe, let me give you some examples. Has God allowed you to live longer than a doctor said you would? Or has God given you a level of mobility beyond what doctors said you would have? Has God protected you from harm or death? Has God provided for your needs when all human resources have failed? Has God shown himself powerful on your behalf in your home, in your work, or in your family? Because we claim that we serve this massive, powerful God, and then we lead lives that are kind of very humanly explainable, right? If, if we're not careful, we lead a life, and, and you say, well, he works hard. And he's lucky, is how some people would throw it in there. What is it in your life that is only explainable by the God you claim to serve? And to take it a step beyond that, as we looked at the children of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, their main concern was for future generations. What is it in your life, what is there in your life that will point your children or your grandchildren, or the generations that follow towards God. The children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, they were serious about it. Serious enough, hey, we're going to build an altar here, a big altar. We're going to build this big altar, and the reason we're doing is for our kids. We want our kids to know we serve God. God did this. What is there in your life that, that you can point to with your kids? Or with my kids and say, God did this. We, I, I serve a big God. Let me show you. And, and you pull out. Make something physical even. Wouldn't be out of, out of place. Let, let me show you the doctor's report that said, I shouldn't be walking right now. I serve a God who's bigger than that. Let me show you this, this thing right here. Let me show you this, this scar that I have. That I should be dead right now, but I serve a big God who protects. What is there in your life that will point future generations? When your grandkids and your great-grandkids are talking about you, they say, boy, great-grandpa sure did serve God, didn't he? You know how I know? Well, I've, I've, got, his, I've got his Bible, and he wrote in the, he wrote in the edge of it. He, he wrote about what God did for him. It's important that you and I make provision for the generations that follow that point them back towards God. That's really important. Why? Well, because the tendency of following generations is to forget. They just slip. They let it slide. And, and have you ever known somebody, maybe you have a friend right now. Maybe it's a parent. 
Maybe it's a grandparent, and, and they look at some of the generations that follow them, and they say, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know why they don't care about God. And I'm not putting the blame for that necessarily on the, on the doorstep of those parents or grandparents. But here's the thing. If we're making, if we're making monuments to the goodness of God, that we can point our children to and we can say, look, God did this. See this house? God provided for it. You see this scar? God protected me. Do you know, you know how we have that car? God gave it to us. You know how we have that health that, that you know, great, you know, grandma, she, she is alive today because of what God did. Point generations behind. To the God you claim to serve. There should be things in your life that can't be explained by your efforts. They should only be explainable by the fact that you serve a great God. Now, do children have their own mind and their own will? Yes, they do. The children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh will eventually make choices that lead them away from God during the period of the judges. But... It's not because of a lack of effort from the older generations to say, hey, we serve God. We're, we're children of the Lord. We're his chosen people. They were willing to get unconventional. We're going we're to build a big altar here on the West Bank so that people will know what we're, what we're looking at. What is it in your life that you have provided for where you deliberately set this up as an illustration of God's goodness? I would encourage you, take some time and look over your life. Number one, what is it that in, in your life is only explainable by the God you claim to serve? And what is it in your life that is going to point the generations that follow you back to the God you claim to serve? Both of those are very, very important. Any thoughts, questions, or comments before we close up? Yes, sir. When you're talking about the promised land, how far past the Jordan? Well, the promised land, the land of Canaan, would be considered technically to be on the west bank. So they inherited on the east bank. It's part of the land that God gave to them, so we could say, it, but it's not technically the land of Canaan. Do you think and it's the land that God gave, or is it the land that they wanted? I think that God gave it to them because of what happened. What happened with Moses? Yeah, I think. Could, could God have in, given them an inheritance on the west bank? He, he could have, but he chose to. Give them inheritance on the east. Yeah. Uh, not on the east bank, no. No, and if you get if you get right down to it, when you hear about the West Bank and the settlements in the West Bank, that's what's called contested territory on the West Bank of the nation of Israel. They own uh, they own at the north, they own all the all the way over to the Jordan, just under the Sea of Galilee. But then if you go down the Jordan River, both sides of the bank are contested. And so it's kind of an interesting interesting study in geography now, for sure. Everybody, and, everybody says they claim it. They, they all lived there at one time. Yeah. And Israel lived there and so did Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. At one time, yeah. Well, we... Yes, sir. We actually, in a way, I said that all the people that are living right now are almost like the people in the wilderness. I said, we can wander in the wilderness till we die, or we can come to the Lord. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good picture that we, a lot of people elect to wander rather than going into the into the promised land. Been there. Yep. <laughs> and sometimes we, we elect to wander even after we've come to the Lord. Anyone else? Good thoughts. Read on ahead in Genesis 49. We'll deal with the rest of the tribes, or we'll, we'll begin to deal with the rest of the tribes next week, Lord willing. But take the lessons that we can learn from the judgment seat of Jacob. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the truths of your word, for the principles that it contains, and for the examples that it sets. Lord, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us to carefully evaluate our lives, to ensure that there are things in our lives that will point 
the next generation to you. I pray that we would that we would make those monuments, that we would be sure to tell the stories of your goodness and of your might and your power and protection. I pray that we would be faithful in doing that as you are faithful in providing everything that we need. I pray that you'd be with us now as we prepare our hearts for the, for the morning service. I pray that you would speak to us through your word, through the music, through everything that we do. I pray in all these things that you would be honored and exalted. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.